Go. Right, so the idea was to do this in 16 minutes. Maybe I should set my timer so I know that it is 16 minutes. Here we go. Um, so, start with the, the idea that basically there's nobody's got a plan for you. If we want to talk uh, in pretent pretentious philosophical terms, we could quote Heidegger, who came up with this uh, idea of Geworfenheit, which means thrownness, and is basically epitomised in the Riders on the Storm song, Into This World We're Thrown Like a Dog Without a Bone. You're basically just thrown into this academic career, and you have to find your way. And nobody's got a plan for you, there's, there's, there's no one, there's no academic god who is looking down upon you and making sure your career works out okay. You've got to make it up for yourself. It's kind of existentialism, if you like, for academics. It's not a ladder. It's a pyramid. But you can still fall off. It's just that with a ladder, you know, you fall off a ladder once. The pyramid, at every stage, people are falling off because there's only a certain number of people who are professors, a certain number of people who are senior lecturers, lecturers, a certain number of people who get tenure positions, many more uh, postdocs and get tenure position, many PhD students do postdocs and so on. So one idea is that you could try and find a mentor, um, but then maybe not every, the, the, the world changes so much that even a mentor might not be able to guide you. So people say that to succeed you need things like motivation, ability and opportunity, or hard work, talent, luck, and a bit of give and take. And that's all true, I'm sure. Um, I've always wondered whether it's actually, if you look at people, uh, the people who get first in their undergraduate degree, do they actually go on become successful academics? Uh, more than people who get two ones or two twos. You know, uh, I think there's an issue about personality actually sometimes more important than raw talent in actually getting up that uh, pyramid, if you like, the greasy pole. Key point is that there's a system out there, and you have to game the system. You're foolish not to game the system, but you shouldn't cheat the system. I'm not suggesting that anyone cheats, but you've got to work out the rules of the game. It's supposed to be a meritocracy, uh, a bit like Egypt's supposed to be a democracy. Uh, you know, that's the way it's supposed to be. But the reality is is not quite like that. Well, yeah, that's true. We all are cynical enough to know that, but. You're supposed to work out those rules of the game and, and, and play within them. <coughs> but another thing you should do is piss in the right places. <laughs> <coughs> now, what I'm saying there, I'm, I'm making a very visual image there just to point out how important it is to maintain your visibility and build a reputation, promote yourself. As I say, there's nobody looking out for you. If you don't promote yourself, then nobody else is going to do it. So you've got to stay visible out there. And one way to do that in the modern online world is to cultivate an online presence, have a Twitter account, write a blog, that sort of stuff. People tell us, you know, you shouldn't be writing review articles anymore because they're not referable, but review articles are good because they do actually create visibility for you. So in fact, one of my colleagues used to travel on the train, he lives in Malvern, and he, he was the one that actually pushed this word visibility into my head, that it, it is an important concept in academic life, so that people know who you are. And the key point is that if they know who you are and they, they associate you with something good, then there's this thing called the halo effect, which means that they'll think that you're generally a good person. So if they see that you've organised a nice meeting for the British Society for Parasitology, let's say, they'll say, wow, she must be a great scientist and a great person, even though they've never read any of your papers or anything about what you do. But there's that halo around you. Or if you maintain a Twitter account and you very active on Twitter, all those kind of things can actually be useful. There's karma, the idea of give and take. Uh, you've got to be nice to people, you've got to give something to the community, you've got to create goodwill. Um, and one way to do that is to create resources that others will want. So in my own experience, we've made various online databases and so forth, and, and that's actually created quite a lot of goodwill in the community. So for a small amount of effort in running some kind of online resource, you get lots of goodwill from the community. Try and be honourable in your dealings with people, not trying to cheat them and be difficult, uh, and, and 
uh, be straightforward with people. Um, you know, what goes around comes around. It's a small world. Uh, you rub someone up the wrong way. It could be them that's reviewing your next grant or your next paper. Um, and, 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 you know, so that's important that you maintain that kind of integrity there. Collaboration is also a key to success because it allows you to outsource, outsource the skills and reputation that you don't have. So you can't be great at everything you do, um, but often you may want to solve a problem using a particular approach that you have no track record in. So if you've got a nice network of people you can call on for collaboration, say, oh, could you make us a few mutants, please, or could you run that through your pipeline for us, or whatever, then that actually allows you to be much more effective. Of course, karma is, you know, there's good and bad karma. Sometimes you have to just subtract from your karma by actually being decisive and saying, no, I'm not doing that, I'm not helping you. Um, Cristala seemed to have come to this revelation as part of her kind of ongoing uh, enlightenment, academic enlightenment uh, in the last uh, year or so when she watched some of the people in Birmingham and, and so forth. You, you sometimes have to look after your own interests. You have to say, I'm not taking on a new commitment and just say no to someone. Uh, if they say, you know, could, can you, could you please run this whole new uh, course that we want to run next year? You're, you know, you're the obvious person to do it. And you say, no, I'm sorry, I don't want to do that. Um, now, obviously, sometimes if, you, if you've got nothing else in your portfolio, then you haven't really got much comeback. But if you're actually showing yourself to be a good person in all the other ways, you can just say no. So I don't want, if, if, if you made me do that, I wouldn't be able to write another grant for the next year or two. And, you know, there's always a trade-off. Key point is also to be to your own self be true. So this is another one where Cristala can tell us what the Greek means. Yeah, I see you're falling asleep there. <laughs> yeah, know yourself. So, um, and that is, you know, you might say it's a bit facetious, but actually, I think it is actually useful. I went, went on this uh, leadership course uh, last year, and you had to do the Myers Briggs personality inventory and a 360 degree appraisal and it actually does give you useful insights into uh, what kind of person you are and where you want to work what kind of um, and it does take time to actually get to, 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 to feel get a feel for that so you know some people would like to be a big boss in a very small pond big fish in a small pond you know would you like to work at the University of Worcester uh, where you could run a whole department or would you rather work at Oxford where they'll give you a shoe, cu a shoe cupboard as your office and, and always tell you that if you don't like this job, there's someone else will take it. And you have to find where do you feel most comfortable in life and that we all have uh, different places on that. Um, you know, work with your own comfort zone. So one of the things on when we did the Myers-Briggs personal in, pers personality inventory was that they make you sign uh, the, the front of the, of the booklet with your right hand, and then they tell you, can you now fill it in with your left hand? What's this about? You fill it in with your left hand, and you do it, and they say, well, you did it, didn't you? But does it look the same? You say, no, it doesn't look as good. And they say, well, that's the point. When you're working outside of the comfort zone for your kind of personality, you can do things, but you just have to work a lot harder, and the results probably won't be as good. So some people are good at, at finishing things off. Some people are good at a, you know, brainstorming our 101 ideas um, and what they told us was that actually you should try and just be sensitive to working with complementary personality types so someone like myself if someone came and closely supervised what I did I would think you know you're an autocrat you're a, you're a dictator on my shoulder get out of here I want to be left to get on with this task you're trying to micromanage me but uh, if, if I then had such a person at a junior level coming to work for me, they would say, well, this guy never tells me what to do. I was expecting him to tell me exactly what I have to do this week and explain all the experiments I have to do. And he just says, go and solve this problem. Uh, and that person might be upset with my management style. And they just, it, it was actually quite enlightening when, when they actually pointed that out, really. Mastering the technology. I came up with this phrase, science is 10% inspiration, 90% instrumentation these days. So there's a lot of truth in that. Actually staying at the cutting edge with technology is very important. Um, 
you have to get comfortable with the idea that many of the technologies you're using are black boxes as far as you're concerned. Um, and there's always, you know, in vivers and so forth, oh, you used a plasmid kit, did you? Can you tell me what, how the plasmid kit, how does your DNA extraction work? And you humiliate the poor old student, but most of what we're working with now is black boxes. We don't have to stand it in great detail. And people like myself, and this man and this man can probably remember those kind of gels where you had to do sequencing the manual way. You have to recognize that anything you learn as a skill it has a finite lifespan. And those skills, well, you may be a really useful person because you know how to run a, to cast a sequencing gel. You come back a few years later, that skill is worthless. You know how to run a microarray. Who does microarrays anymore? Yeah. Do you want to take comments at the end? I was, we're recording this, so we're going to take comments at the end. But we, we note that you have returned, and we're very pleased because you can act as a counterweight to my talking blarney. And if you disagree with anything I say at the end, you can comment on it. Um, you know, in, in 10 or 20 years' time, uh, your students and PhD students and, and, and postdocs will just laugh at your PhD thesis. You know, they'll come in your office and say, what did he do for his PhD? Oh, he sequenced one gene. Now they'll say, you sequenced one genome? You do genomes by the 10,000 now for PhDs, you know, in the year 2020 or 2030, um, and so on. What do you work on? Um, well, Emma pointed out a nice paper by Uri Allen about this kind of thing. There's this issue, you know, try and th what they're telling us about the ref, you know, think strategically, work on a big canvas. Don't just, just do incremental research where there's been a hundred other examples of this and you're providing 101st. Try and do something that's genuinely new, timely, original, important. It's obviously a big ask to expect, you know, the ref says publish four great papers in five years. It would be hard to just publish those papers. You, usually you would have to have lots of other small papers as well just to keep your lab going and keep people's careers going. Um, and, you know, as a kind of reductio ad absurdum, this guy here, Charles Darwin, you know, imagine him deciding what to work on and trying to apply to a research council for a grant proposal with, you know, my research objective is to explain the origins of life on Earth. Uh, I think I only need 20 or 30 years to do this, and um, my track record is oh, I've been around the world in a boat, and I know a little bit about geology. You know, we, he wouldn't have got funding for that. Um, he wouldn't have got funding for it now. He was self-funded, yeah. Um, and also, when you're choosing what to work on, and you can say, I mean, I'm only going to attack really hard problems, but there's a phrase from Peter Medawar, science is the art of the soluble, which is, You've got to choose problems that are kind of bite-sized that you can actually get somewhere with it. There's no point in trying to attack something so big that you'll never get there. For normal people, there are some abnormal people. You know, people like Steve Busby, they get every grant they apply for, their FRS and all that kind of stuff. They never get papers turned out. But most people, you have to work on things that are, you're not always going to get it right. You have to go around the obstacles. And the thing is to come up with a blend of risky stuff and easy wins. Um, and there's some discussion on Twitter recently about the death of the genome paper, the idea that you know just collecting loads of observations easily because you've got the, the right technology, that's a bit boring. And it it was there was a golden era that Rick spoke about around the turn of the millennium where you could get every genome paper was a nature paper, um, but now that's not the case. And you just need to have that risk of that blend of risk and, and also some capacity to surprise. So if it's if you say something that the reader didn't expect that will get you good science, get you good uh, papers. You have to be ready to fail as well. Um, so that, they, like they say about entrepreneurs, you have to set up one, two, three companies and they all fail. And then your fourth company is the one that makes you a million pounds. Another idea you can do is to actually clone ideas so that if you, if you can actually say that I want to work on small RNAs in Psilocyphalus and then actually I want to work on small RNAs in Bacillus thuringiensis, I want to work on small RNAs and staph aureus, I want to work on small RNAs and staph aureus. and you can have four different grant proposals, all basically the same idea, um, and that's perfectly fine. It's a way of expanding the repertoire. The other question is, you know, how much do you stay in one particular group, become a specialist, or would you become a smart generalist? Uh, there's a book called Microserves by uh, Douglas Copeland talking about the kind of the, the initial stages of the sort of Silicon Valley industry, and he, there's a phrase in there that, that, that 
if you want a team leader, you want a smart journalist who knows a little bit about uh, everything. Um, I guess one way of looking at it, I always look at it, is that it's a struggle between ADHD and, and Asperger's. So ADHD, attention deficit disorder, you're always flitting around looking at loads of different things, jumping all over the place. Um, in fact, one of my school reports, it said, must learn to control his grasshopper mind, what my maths teacher wrote one year. Versus the kind of Asperger's autism thing where you just become absolutely obsessed with the detail of one little thing and really flog it to death and keep going at it. And in the sense, we can make a, an analogy with flagellar motility. How far do you keep swimming in the same direction and how often do you actually stop and tumble around and move into a different direction? I think part of that, you know, I, I don't think there's a, an absolute answer there. I've worked on all sorts of different things. Um, and people have said, oh, you shouldn't do that. You should have worked on one thing and become known as the expert on X. Uh, Brendan Wren is a friend of mine. He's similarly he's done the same kind of thing. Uh, so I don't think you can give a, a real strong prescriptive answer there. But it's something you should think about as well, what you do. The key point is also not to get bored. So it depends on your threshold for boredom. If you sort of think working in the same, oh, I've overdone my time. I have to talk a bit faster. Um, and one of the problems also is just because you've been doing something for ages and you know you can do the next thing, maybe you shouldn't do that because you'll end up getting bored just taking on a project that you, just because you can. You've got to learn to write well, um, and we're going to be doing all that in a minute when we do the grant proposal, so I won't say much more about that. Publish regularly. The ref is telling us we have to have four four-star papers in five years. How many papers should you be putting out a year? Well, when I started out, I was told oh, one per month. I think one per month is probably a bit much. And in fact, we had a guy who came for a research fellowship, a Birmingham fellowship, a couple of years ago, who told us he put out a paper a month and he could write a paper in a day. And we said, that's not what we want with REF anymore. I think I average about eight or ten papers a year. But those are not all research papers by any means, and they're not all quality papers. But you need to maintain visibility. Coming back to this game of academic life, it's, it's, it's a game of chance. It's not, quite, it's not like snakes and ladders where it's completely just chance. It's more like backgammon where if you play things right, you can progress and do well. But it's not like chess. It's not entirely deterministic. And uh, The point is that a grant or paper doesn't have to be bad to fail. I mean, this is something I remember early on. Why did my grant not get funded? Well, there was nothing wrong with it. It's just that it wasn't as competitive as the other ones. Um, and and uh, Charles will probably explain this in a moment. You know, they, they might be able to uh, fund 20% or 25% of the grants. 50% of the grants are actually perfectly good grants. So 25% of the grants or 30% of the grants will just get chucked out, even though they are fundable. Um, and in the Birmingham Fellowship Scheme, we, uh, well, Emma will remember, I think, that the, the, one of my questions was, you know, you've written down here in your research program, you will have your first grant at the end of year one. How many proposals are you going to have to write to get that first grant funded? Um, you know, what is the average success rate with the BBSLC? Oh, it's one in five. So you, stupid person then says, oh, okay, I'll have to write five grant proposals. Someone who's slightly more intelligent would say, well, that's the average, but I'm above average. I might have to write two proposals to get one funded. Um, Ian Henderson, who is now a highly successful scientist in Birmingham, when he came and worked as a lecturer in his first year for me in Belfast, he wrote 17 proposals. It shows you the kind of level of industriousness that you might need. They weren't all project grant proposals. Many of them were like small equipment grants for 3,000 quid or whatever, but that basically shows you the kind of thing you're up against. You've got to keep your hope up, keep your mental robustness up. Uh, I showed these slides um, to Lawrence, and he said, oh, well, this is a point that you have to realise in this game, which is up to 90% of what you do will result in failure. And you just have to keep going. You don't take it personally when you don't fail to get a grant or paper published. Just keep, you just have to keep going, and it requires a certain mental robustness to do that. But fail successfully, you know, learn something from your failure. Maintain a sense of optimism. I read the Steve Jobs biography, and they talk in there about how he had a reality distortion field which he basically, you know, he thought it was too easy to do things, that things could get done in a period of time, and everyone else would say, no, you can't do that in that time, or you can't even do it at all. But he managed to invent the iPhone and the iPod and revolutionise the cinema industry and change the way we listen to music and all those things because of this. And so, in a sense, being over-optimistic is, is needed. And 
one of the things I try and do, in fact, I've fallen behind out of this at the moment, is always have at least one, uh, more than one grant in the pipeline at any one time. So if you fail to get a grant, you get that letter that says, sorry, you ain't got it. You can say, oh, well, I'll get the next one. And you can just keep your peck that way. So if you've got nothing to hope for, it, it can be quite demoralising. And obviously, the more successful you get, the more successful you will become after success breeds success. So you get one BBSLC grant, it's much easier to then get your second BBSLC grant. You've had two BBSLC grants, it's easier to get your third one and so forth. And same is true of papers in high-impact journals. As we've got our second paper in New England Journal. Okay, it's only a letter, but it's second publication in New England Journal in, in as many, in, in sort of two years, because we now, they know us, we know them, we're, we're in that kind of game. One thing that I think is important is that you shouldn't make yourself too busy, um, and there is a certain machismo, well you could call it machismo, but actually I've seen women that do it more than men in some ways, which is that you have your diary blocked up for months in advance and there's no slots in it. Uh, if you do that, then you'll never have any time to engage your curiosity, passion, creativity, imagination, thinking, all those things that are supposed to be what you do in science. And if you leave some slack in your diary and in your life, then you can take risks. Uh, and you, If something comes along that is serendipitous, you can seize it and do it. Um, and you know, we've had a lot of that recently. In fact, most of the success that I've had in the last few years has been out of things that weren't programmed into a grant, into a thing. They were just things that came onto our lap, and, but we were in the right place, right time, we had the right skill set, and we could make use of it. Read widely, but not too much. Uh, you know, so you don't need to have an encyclopedic knowledge of the field to make a, a contribution. Social media are actually very useful for taking the temperature of the field, working out what other people are reading, and Twitter in particular is a sort of global journal club. I'm running out of time, aren't I? Stay balanced, avoid perfectionism. So get grants off the desk. You know, don't hang on to it. And, and, uh, and, and, and you know, in fact, even with Charles, he's an old lag at this game. I remember having a disagreement about our chicken grant. And he was saying, you can't put it in. We haven't got time. We had like two weeks ago. I said, yes, we have. Let's just get it off the bloody desk. And, and we got it. And it was all right. Um, maintain work-life balance. So someone asked... Do I think you should work 60-hour weeks? No, I don't. I don't work evenings and weekends. I don't expect, you know, because the European Working Time Directive tells us our employers not ex allowed to expect us to work more than 37 and a half hour weeks in any 13-week period on average. Um, obviously, if you've got a grant proposal deadline coming up, then you might work the weekend. You might have to, but it's not shouldn't be part of your normal life, day in, day out, week in, week out. And also, grants aren't contracts. So if you get some money on a grant, you can. You know, you've got to fulfil what you say in the grant, but even then, they don't. They, they, if you write your final report and you've only got three out of the five things done, they, they you know, you, nobody comes along and, 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 and tortures you about it. But the point is, if you don't actually have a little bit of time to, to do new things, uh, you'll never get the next great paper or grant because it, how, how will you actually build uh, up that seed corn? Stay fresh, don't be boring, avoid boring people. That was a Jim Watson's latest book uh, biography. I, I think, you know, mixing with the right peer group, uh, smart people, hiring smart people. Gaddy Frankel, a mate of mine, he said, you know, you have to hire six people to get one good person. Um, I think I've been lucky and actually uh, much better than that lately. Uh, but it, there's some truth in it, you know, you just got to be careful of what you do there. Why have a dog and bark? I, I mean, you have to, I, I find I just have to tolerate my own ignorance um, because you can't know everything. And you know, there, there's a little, there is a little voice at the back of my head that says, well, I don't quite understand the current aluminum my seat workflow in any detail at all. And then you sort of think, well, why do I need to know that? Because I just write the grants and the papers and other people do that. And I don't need to know exactly that. And one of the phrases that came out of this management course is, leadership course was that you need to stay in helicopter mode and that people making the transition from postdocs to being in their first tenure position where they start supervising people start supervising PhD students you know you, you don't want to leap in and just do it yourself or the, you know there may be that uh, that may be your um, first impulse but in fact it's best to stay back and stay in helicopter mode floating above the problem and taking a, a global picture and whatever and finally the whole point is that we all come into science because we have overactive curiosity, if you like, and the, the key point about your career is, is to keep feeling fascination in the words of the old 
uh, 80s song from the Human League, uh, looking, learning, moving on. Shows my age, but there you are. I almost was tempted to show you the video of the song, but then I decided not to. Okay, that's it. So.